Um, you know, years ago when I first started practicing law, uh, compliance as a concept was abstract and people in corporations thought this is a waste of time, it's a lost leader, why, why should we spend money on compliance? But today I think it's a, it's a must-have uh, ingredient to a successful corporation. Um, so with that uh, preamble, let me turn things over to Amy Wall. Amy. Thank you, Joe. Um, good afternoon, everybody, or maybe it's still morning. A root cause of some of these problems is something you kind of wonder about sometimes, and you wonder, how did this ever happen in a company? And then when you go over the facts of what happened with Volkswagen, it is so obvious the root cause of how this happened was a combination of uh, factors that it was just bound to happen, something like this, um, given the situations both within the company and what was occurring outside of the company. Uh, Volkswagen's one of, of course, you're all familiar with, is one of the largest companies in the world. And in 2007, a man named Martin Winterkorn took over as uh, the CEO. He was focused primarily on making sure that they hit certain strategy goals. It was all about how many Volkswagens they can sell, how they can become bigger than Toyota, how they can hit their strategy 2018, next year. It was a plan that they had put into place because they wanted to become the leaders both economically and ecologically at the same time. So they had big focuses on both, but mainly they wanted to put out a lot of cars. And they wanted to get, by 2018, 10 million of their cars sold in the United States, and they wanted to surpass as a Toyota. So under the leadership of Mr. Wintercorn, he seemed like a real control freak from everything I read about him, that he tightly controlled the company, he, centri he highly centralized it in the top management, and the corporate culture became one of command and control. The leadership was aggressive, and he set goals that were often under circumstances circumstances became unattainable to the people involved. And his senior executives were involved in even minor um, decision making. Um, the company gained a reputation for being both hard charging and brutally competitive. They're a German company, so their uh, thought process in terms of the way they managed wasn't what we would in the United States. It was really a German culture to begin with. And then add on top of that, the culture of the company in particular be, being competitive. Former employees described the environment as fearful. Um, they were fail, uh, fearful admitting failure. They were fearful of contradicting their supervisors. Wintercorn came with an engineering background and he kept a very close eye on the production. So it's kind of hard to believe he didn't really realize what was going on. His mentor in the company was Ferdinand Piesch who is the former CEO and also is the grandson of VW. So he felt a really close tie to this company and really felt like he had to perform. And he also, um, Mr. Piesch, boasted that he uh, elicited superior performance by, quote, terrifying the engineers. Uh, it was well known that VW executives and engineers would be, quote, shaking in their boots prior to presentations before Piesch, knowing that if he was displeased, they might be fired instantly. It was a terrifying place to work. Wintercorn was considered a cold, distant figure known for obsessive attention to detail. He was known for carrying a gauge around in his pocket. Here's the CEO, right? Some people never even see him, but if he shows up, he's got this gauge in his pocket, and he would take it over to the cars, and he'd measure flaws in the vehicle as they were coming down off of the production lines. And he would also publicly disparage the employees. So their fear would be borne out by just, you know, you'd be standing there doing your job and get yelled at by the CEO. He didn't like bad news, and before anyone reported anything to him, they kind of said, oh, well, we better have good news for Mr. Wintercorn. In the mid-2000s, there were persistently high gas prices, and there were tough mileage standards throughout the automobile industry. And that put a lot of pressure on everybody, including VW, to design more fuel-efficient vehicles. At the same time, there were growing concerns over the climate change and the cause, cause of that, that caused increasingly stringent emission controls. So automakers needed to find a way to optimize both their fuel efficiency and still make a high-performing vehicle because that's what people wanted, particularly people in the United States, and they were trying to up their United States cars. So how do you do that? Automakers uh, 
decided that rather, they, VW, decided that rather than try to compete in the hybrid market, which was sort of where things were going, the hybrid uh, electric cars, they saw a real future in diesel. They were going to take that method, okay, we're going to go with diesel and we're going to put our eggs in that diesel basket. So they saw a high growth opportunity in the United States because diesel wasn't so big in the United States. So they thought, okay, we'll be in the diesel market and we're going to kind of corner the diesel market and diesel cars. And they saw a huge opportunity there because they thought they could have a, an eco-friendly diesel car and still make it cheaper, powerful. They could make it a perfect car in diesel and they would have the market on it. So in 2007, diesel market made up half of the new car sales in Europe, but it was only 5% of the U.S automobile sales. So they saw potential there, at least 15 more percent of the U.S. market they could get. But before they could market a fuel-efficient diesel in the United States, they had to get over a really major problem. Diesel cars generated more nitrous, nitrogen oxide, NOx, than gasoline-powered engines. So it made it really hard for them to meet the uh, emissions requirements in the United States, because if they tried to monkey with that, then they wouldn't have as good a performance in their car. So in order to sell their cars in the U.S. market with the critical goal of becoming the largest manufacturer of cars in the United States and in, later in the world, they had to engineer a way to strip its car of the pollutants to meet the U.S. regulation standards, and they needed to do it ASAP because the standards were in place and their goals were still in place. So in 2008, VW announced that they had a new clean diesel technology called the Lean NOx, which is nitrous and oxides, trap, which it claimed had solved the problems, okay? Solved all the problems of delivering high fuel efficiency while still meeting the emission standards. In 2009, the clean diesel Jetta TDI won the Green Car of the Year Award. Right, beating out the hybrids and the electric vehicles. Some of the vehicles reportedly were diesel, were getting 60 mile per hour, which was unheard of even in, in any non-electric or hybrid cars. Clean diesel became the centerpiece of VW's US marketing strategy. Sales took off. By 2014, uh, VW diesel cars accounted for 21%. So they even went past what the expectations were of the U.S. sales. By 2014, VW is one of the largest companies, companies, period, in the world. It had factories in 31 countries and almost 600,000 employees. And they were well on their way to achieving their strategy 2018. Their worldwide sales had increased approximately 7.2 percent until 2014. But there was a major hurdle along the way. In 2011, while VW was investing in their diesel strategy, the EPA officials announced a plan to require automobile makers to increase the fleet-wide fuel efficiency from an average of 35.5 miles per gallon to 54. Huge leap. And they needed to do that by 2025. While at the same time, they were requiring the automobiles reduce their emissions. So the United States was offering credits, the EPA through the United States was offering credits to hybrid and electric car manufacturers to offset the expenses in trying to meet these standards, but they weren't offering these same credits to diesel. So they were really in a bad position. So the EPA took the position they weren't going to offer the credits to diesel because they said that the diesel engines emitted much higher level of pollutants. They did and that they were um, just not as efficient and, and they weren't the kind of cars that you don't want to be making. They wanted high efficiency, uh, low emission. This left VW with a fleet that did not meet at that time the uh, EPA standards and they couldn't get any credits and they were in a problem. So somehow, however, magically, they managed to produce diesel cars that were meeting the EPA tests. And in 2013, it became kind of noticeable that this was sort of a weird thing that was going on. These are cars that can't meet the test, yet they are. So a clean transportation nonprofit noticed that they were actually, when they would run the VWs, they were running cleaner in the United States than they would run in Europe. So, huh? It's like some continental difference. So they tested to see why, and they figured out that VWs in lab diesel emissions were lower than their on-the-road emissions. Okay, so that was weird. And they turned over the findings to EPA, and the EPA researchers did a lot better research on it. And they looked at VW's software. 
and they found these millions of lines of software coding and found that there were these weird instructions. And they would send the ad admission control instructions out. So whenever the diesel was only utilizing two of its tires, which is what they do when they're testing it, that it would have a different emissions control showing up in their computer system than it was running on all four, which is how it runs on the road. Okay, so that was odd. So on September 18, 2015, one week after being named the world's most sustainable automobile maker, VW admitted that it had installed these defeat devices. Now they said in 500,000 diesel cars, um, since 2009, well it turned out there were 11 million cars on the, on the road with these defeat devices. And they were emitting actually 40 times the legal limit of pollution. So that was how they were able to do it. Well, VW officials apologized. We're really sorry. We didn't mean to be doing this. Uh, we didn't know this was going on. We didn't have any idea. This was all, you know, just the people who were in engineering. That was really actually a mistake they made. It was just an engineering error. Uh, we didn't have any idea, and we're not responsible, but we're going to help. You know, we're going to do everything we can to rectify this. Um, they claimed that the millions of lines of software that were hard for the people to figure out, well, how were they going to figure that out? They wouldn't be able to know that that was going on in their cars. And they testified before uh, Congress in 2015 that the defeat devices were not a corporate decision. They were instead the work of a couple of software engineers. And Mr. Winterkorn resigned five days after the scandal became public. In January 2017, VW pled guilty to conspiring to defraud the United States and VW's U.S. customer. They pled guilty to violating the Clean Air Act, obstruction of justice because they destroyed documents, um, and they also pled guilty to importing cars into the United States making false statements about their emissions. Under the terms of the plea agreement, they agreed to play a, pay a $2.8 billion fine, be on probation for three years. They were put under an independent corporate compliance monitor to oversee the company for three years, and they agreed to cooperate with the Justice Department's ongoing investigation. Meanwhile, there's also a German investigation going on at the same time. VW also paid $14.7 billion dollars in settlement costs. I mean, if they were worried before about not hitting their goals, this kind of put a dent in their goals. And six of their VW executives, but they were really employees, underneath employees, were ultimately indicted in the Eastern District of Michigan for their roles in what turned out to be at least a 10-year conspiracy. Uh, these were people who were head of engineering and uh, compliance, head of engineering development, head of after treatment department of engineering, and even the supervisor responsible for the quality management and control. Only one of these six people who were indicted um, was arrested, because everybody's in Germany, he shows up in Miami, so he gets arrested. He was the general manager in charge of the environment and engineering office. And he reported directly to one of these other guys who was indicted. Anyway, he's pled guilty. His name is Schmidt. He, uh, they sent him up to Michigan. This is all out of the Eastern District of Michigan. And on August 7th, he pled guilty to the conspiracy. He faces seven years in prison. Sentencing is December 7th. Um, as an interesting aside, Schmidt is represented, I thought this was interesting, by an attorney named Margaret Wintercorn Meyer. And I tried to Google, is there any relation between Margaret and Mr. Wintercorn, but I couldn't find anything, but that's kind of an unusual name. And just if any of y'all um, have any questions about compliance programs, uh, they had a compliance program. And they had a pretty significant one. They sent them to training on the compliance program for years. Um, and they knew what their responsibilities were within the company, but they, I think they had 135 thousand employees who went through this compliance training program. So it uh, didn't work so much. Hey, Amy, that's a great presentation. So I'm, I'm guessing there are probably people in the audience who didn't know all those facts and details. And they really set the stage for taking a look at what comes when you have one of these things happen. This is the guilty plea and other pertinent documents, which has to be worth millions of dollars, maybe a billion dollars. Who knows what this costs? 
Larry Thompson of Atlanta, former Deputy Attorney General, former U.S. Attorney in Atlanta, is the is, is I think is the monitor in this case in Volkswagen. So uh, anyway, he has an army of lawyers working for him in both Germany and in uh, and the United States. What I thought I'd do now, David Hill, is to talk with you a little bit about, and thank you so much, because that really captures what I think was the vision of Thomas Jefferson, a.k.a. Mitch Mitchelson, for this panel, was, uh, was sort of the cautionary tale that Volkswagen sets for all of us to think about in terms of, you know, the role of GCs inside of corporations. Your lens is important to think about CEOs like Martin Wintercorn. Uh, David? So thank you, Joe, and thank you very much for inviting me to be here today. I um, I have the uh, the highest regard for Joe Whitley, so when he calls and asks me to do something, why I don't actually take it as a request. I just take it as an order. So uh, glad to be here, Joe. And I, I, I was also thinking, you know, there are a free credit or um, or a, a voucher for staying for the, the the rest of this. I was thinking maybe dinner with Joe Whitley would have been sure to a completely full room. But I, I, I very much appreciate you all staying. Um, I mean, it's just a, a spectacularly beautiful day out there today. And of course, I feel for the folks that are about to be affected by uh, by Hurricane Irma, as, uh, as Joe was noting, uh, NRG, we actually, uh, we have generating uh, facilities all over the country, but our largest portion of generation is in the state of Texas. And uh, we had a number of facilities very significantly affected by the flooding, and, and also a lot of employees that were uh, were very significantly affected. We had one of our one of our plants in Texas had uh, had 50 inches of rain um, recorded, and uh, you know you think hmm, 50 inches of rain, four over four feet of rain. Um, so, but I but they um, they uh, the plants actually performed um, uh, remarkably. Uh, well, fortunately, and uh, including the nuclear plant that we own about half of that uh, that sits just a very short distance from the Gulf Coast that was uh, that was performing at, at full power through the entire um, flood and hurricane. So pretty uh, pretty remarkable technology. So. Um, what Amy was talking about there in, in uh, Volkswagen, the Volkswagen situation, and I'll offer just a couple of thoughts from both the perspective of. Um, um, having been in the government and also as a general counsel of a, of a public company. You know, you hear a story like that and you think, well, you know, I mean, bad actors could never happen here. Um, but you know, what's truly remarkable about the, the, the story that Amy just read is there's nothing remarkable about it. There's nothing unusual. There is nothing new that happened in that case that hasn't happened many times before. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, again, the facts are a little different, but, but fundamentally what caused that to happen and what, uh, the, why it happened, nothing unusual about it. And in fact, for people thinking un uh, uh, it's, uh, it's unusual is what ensures that it keeps happening again and again and again. I think the, when, um, when Joe first called about this and told me the title, I said, well, you know, what immediately occurs to me is the GM ignition switch failure situation. And I don't know how many of you all have actually ever read the report, this report. Um, you can just Google it and find it on the web. It's the report prepared by Jenner and Block. Uh, Tony Volucas, former U.S. attorney in Chicago, and his firm, Jenner and Block, prepared this report. It is chock full of interesting stuff. Not so much about the particular facts about the technology of the ignition switch on the cobalts and all that sort of thing. Um, which unless you're in the auto industry, you know, I mean, you can sort of say, well, you know, that, that isn't going to apply to me. But there is a lot of stuff in here, and, and of course in the fact set that Amy was just reading through, that you can say, well, you know, how would this apply to my company? And I think actually I would really commend this to you all to, to read the report with that in mind, because it is something where you can find stuff in here, I certainly can, where I would look at it and say, well, you know, I don't know, is that actually, is, do I have that situation present in my company? Do I have a situation where that could come up? I mean, one of the things that, uh, that you read, read here, the, I'll even tell you the page. Um, you know, it's, uh, let's see, I mean, what page is it? 254, yeah, thank you very much, great glasses. Um, you know, it talks about, um, uh, the GM salute and the GM nod, a cultural issue repeatedly um, described uh, to us and borne out by the evidence is a proliferation of committees and a lack of accountability. The cobalt ignition switch issue passed through an astonishing number of committees 
repeatedly heard from witnesses that they flagged the issue, proposed a solution, and the solution died in a committee or with some other ad hoc group exploring the issue, but determining the identity of any actual decision maker was, impenetra uh, was in impenetrable, impossible. I mean, I think that one of the things, and, and I will say that if there's a criticism I have of this report is it sort of seems to me to recommend a number of things that actually call for more committees and more process. I, I actually think that uh, Companies often will set up compli you know, compliance offices. Well, let's have a compliance, a compliance app. With, with the feeling, I think, that sometimes that leads to among employees that compliance is outsourced to that piece of the company. Um, I, you know, if there, if there are a couple of different things that I, I sort of draw from my own experience, both, both at a company and in terms of a government agency, and then I can offer to you, and then I'm happy to answer, answer questions in a little bit. Number one is, um, and Amy was talking about the CEO having established uh, ha ha what the CEO's role was. The leader of a, of a company or an organization establishes the culture, period, I believe. Um, and they, of course, establish it not by what they say, they establish it by what they do and what they reward. And, the, uh, and I will tell you that people in general, employees, I'm talking about employees here fundamentally, but human beings in general are far better at figuring at, out what actually is, um, uh, what a culture is, what a person wants, than people ever give themselves credit for. The employees of a company will absolutely be remarkable in their ability to figure out what the leader of the company, what is actually being rewarded, what the culture actually is. If you asked a, a number of people, employees at a company, a lot of times they'd act mystified by that, or they might recite whatever it is that the, that the company motto is or whatever. But I will tell you, the employees can figure it out, and the leader sets it. Would act, which actually, what, so what's the corollary, corollary of that in my mind? The only way you change it is by changing the leader. I actually, my personal view is that it is impossible, not hard, it is impossible to change the, cult, the culture of a company without changing the leader. My view. Um, now, in terms of the, um, uh, what in, in any of the organizations that, that any of us lead, whether it's the legal department of a company, a law firm, a department of a law firm. Well, of course, the organization itself can have a leader, but of course, any of us are leaders of our own pieces of a company or, or of a firm. Well, uh, of course, our own, all the employees in our particular areas are looking to us with that in mind, too. I sometimes wonder whether or not leaders actually recognize that they have the power that they do to establish culture and that, that, uh, and that the, the people in their organization are absolutely clairvoyant in terms of figuring out what the leader actually wants. Um, because I will tell you, they are. Um, so that's number one. And of course, the VW case is a perfect example of it. I think the GM situation is an example of it. Look at what we're seeing in the paper about what happened at Wells Fargo. Another situation. I mean, every organization that thinks it can't happen there is making a mistake. I mean, they're, they're, it is repl replete with examples of where, the, where things like this have, have happened. Number two, what is it that people actually, did, did the folks in the VW situation think that they were doing something wrong? How many people actually were in that situation where they thought, mm, actually, I'm doing something wrong? You know, my view is very few, maybe zero. They actually viewed themselves as uh, serving the higher purpose, actually as established by the CEO, but also just sort of thinking they were actually doing the right thing. See, this is the other thing, why this keeps happening again. Nobody ever, or well, maybe not nobody, very few people think of themselves as bad people. Um, and as soon as they ascribe these other situations to having been caused by bad people, they've now assured that, 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 uh, that, that, that they have increased exponentially the chance that they themselves will make a similar mistake. I, I'm, I, I sort of operate under the assumption that these situations happen not because people are bad people. People are actually trying to do exactly what they think that they should be doing. Um, 
And so in terms of looking at your own organizations or thinking about how do you prevent this from happening, it's never good, I, I think it is never good to ascribe what happened to somewhere else as the fact that there were bad actors or bad people. Um, instead, it's people who were actually doing what it is that they thought they, were, they, they, they ought to be doing. You know, David, one thing we discussed earlier today is the potential misalignment between incentives that an organization creates and what, in fact, is good for the organization. I think that's a common pattern in these cases. And, and, and what Amy described is, of course, a perfect example. I mean, I'm sure the CEO actually got rewarded for having established a very clear objective for the company. Um, and having relentlessly pursued it. Boards are constantly harping on CEOs to do that. I mean, I'll just make a final point, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Mitchell and Justin. I, you know, the other one is, is accountability. I think, um, well, I'll make two points. Accountability, ensuring that, that, uh, that as much as possible, things aren't assigned to a, a, a proliferation of committees. Who is a person who actually has accountability? And it can't all be just the CEO, and until the CEO approves it, then nothing happens. Final thought is for all the lawyers in the room, I, I, again, I, if there's anything I would say about the um, Belucas report, it's that he takes it, to, uh, one thing is I think he takes it too easy on the lawyers. Lawyers can sometimes excuse themselves and say that, well, I'm an advocate. I'm an advocate. I, I look out for the company. I mean, I, I try to protect the company's interests. There were things that in this case, the actions by lawyers that caused people to die. Yeah, and, uh, and I think that there's... Can you tell them exactly what you mean by that? Well, the, it's, it's right in here where the, there's a, a situation, and it's, again, it's documented right in the report, where there was the, the evidence was presented in a case, in a deposition. So, you know, this stuff was actually going on. Plaintiff's lawyers were, were on this. In April of 2013, all of the information, this is on uh, page 288 of the report, of, uh, to, to put together the fact of the ignition switches uh, could be turned off and it, the ignition could be turned off inadvertently. Once the car was turned off, it turned off the airbags. Once the airbags couldn't be deployed and the car was in a wreck, somebody was going to get, have, the car was going to crash and the airbags were not going to be deployed. All of that was known. All of that was put together in April 2013. And it was nine more months before recalls were ordered. Amazing. And, 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 and Mitchell, your perspective as a, your, your company is held by private equity, correct? And so it's a smaller correct. company. So your perspective on some of this well, culture issue. Uh, yeah, I, I'd say a point that David just made that I think it's useful to keep in mind, which is that as lawyers we are advocates and we are to look out for the interest of the corporation or the entity we represent. But the fact is, I think we need an intelligent and thoughtful view of what in fact that interest is. And I think a narrow short-term interest can lead us down certain paths that are not necessarily going to advance the longer-term interests of the organization. And I think certainly in the case of General Motors, the easy decision on a short-term basis was to kind of kick the can down the road and hope that maybe things wouldn't prove to be as bad as people thought they would be or that nothing would be discovered. Although, by the way, I always believe everything does come out in the wash ultimately. Anybody who believes that something is going to be kept secret that is material, that is never going to happen. But I think if you have a bigger picture view in mind of what is good for the organization on a long-term basis, in situations such as this, you will in fact recognize that the right thing to do is to take a more active role, bring it to the attention of the appropriate people in the organization. We had this discussion earlier as to who that would be, uh, depending on the circumstances. Uh, it could arrive ultimately on the uh, desk of the CEO, and if that's not the uh, appropriate place or that's not where you get the appropriate answer, take it further upstream to the board of directors. But on a general basis, I think keeping in mind the bigger picture interests of the company and accepting the reality of the fact that in a sense there are no secrets, certainly as to anything that is material, I think that's a useful guide to keep in mind. And uh, before we move to Justin, yeah. one of the things I think about in your company is the 1,000 uh, locations, 12,000 employees, mm -hmm. smaller operation, but one of the things I've heard you talk about is accountability and being the, the willingness to instill in the employees. And again, I think all the prosecutors have probably left by now. Maybe they had to go back. <laughs> to their offices for, uh, for work, but one of the things that will this ultimately happens is this will be, the audience will be the government in some form, regulatory or otherwise. So you, you, I think you may have mentioned um, about 
the concept of mistakes were made, but not by me. Yes, and that's the title of a, of a book, or one of my favorite titles. The title of the book is Mistakes Were Made, parenthesis, but not by me. And that kind of fits in with the idea that nobody ever takes responsibility for things, which candidly is a frequent uh, concomitant of corporate life, and certainly kind of reminds me of, an, of another example of the General Motors case that David mentioned, which is that you have all these compartmentalized structures and systems and committees, and there's not connectivity. And that kind of structure, even though in paper and in theory it will look good, can actually militate against an intelligent resolution of problems, because because only aspects of problems are focused on by particular subunits as opposed to a problem in its entirety. And, and uh, thank you, Mitchell. And one of the things that we talked about, Justin, earlier was the sort of the, the bone and sinew and uh, all that of good compliance. Um, you know, there are really two components of it, the structure and then the human beings. But perhaps you could talk about the development of the compliance program, and then we could sort of circle back with the other panelists. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, one of the things that comes to my mind when I when I think about this Volkswagen case, and when I hear Amy run through the facts and and, and read more about it, is everything that Volkswagen had from a compliance standpoint. They had a 20-member uh, board that was responsible for corporate governance. Um, as Amy mentioned, they had a, a code of conduct. They trained all their employees. Um, they had core values. Um, they had core values around customer focus, superior performance, creating value, renewability, respect, and responsibility, and sustainability. And you know, everyone in this room will recognize those are elements of a effective compliance program. It's not all of them. I'm sure they had the rest of them. Um, but even with all that in place, they had this extreme failure, right? It cost them, I think, the bottom line is about $20 billion in, in fines, not including the attorney's fees uh, that go along with that. So it, it, you're kind of left to say, well, how did this happen? And as, um, as we've already discussed, you know, culture <clears throat> caused that to happen. And, and some of the case facts uh, explain uh, the, or give us insight in, into what that culture is. Um, you know, 10 years ago, uh, if we'd had a conference like this, we would have been talking about the, the, the elements of an effective c compliance program. Five years ago, we would have been talking about how do we measure effectiveness of those programs. Uh, and again, today, we're talking about compliance. It, it seems like organizations should have learned how to do this. Um, and to me, I think the disconnect is uh, what David alluded to is where you you separate compliance and you set it off to the side and you say compliance, the department is responsible for compliance. Uh, I've been inside organizations and, and, and asking them about their compliance program and you say who's responsible and everyone says oh compliance is, is responsible and then you go you talk to compliance and they say well everyone's responsible. Right? Isn't that true in nearly every organization? We, we see that dynamic. And so the challenge, I think, is how do we integrate compliance uh, into the culture? Um, so, it, and we can talk more about that. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to do uh, it, because of the, the human element. Um, a few other things, uh, Joe, that kind of speak to that, that human element that we talked about before it, that, that come to light in reading through this case is one, um, I, th I think we have to recognize that humans have an incredible capacity to lie to themselves. And once you lie to yourself, you're, you're almost forced to lie to someone else about it, right? Because you're not going to admit to yourself uh, that you lied. And I think in organizational life, in corporate life, that happens in two ways. We rationalize our behavior and we minimize our behavior. And I think Volkswagen demonstrates both those on the rationalization side uh, and the minimization side. They, this emission standard problem was well known. Um, depending on the different uh, uh, backgrounds you read, it, it was identified in either 2005 or 2006. Um, it was quickly characterized by the company as a technical difficulty. Um, and it went forward through the manufacturing process as any other technical difficulty. It was something that needed to be worked out at some point down the road in conjunction with maximizing performance, 
maximizing sales and everything else. So I think that's a perfect example of how uh, the organization rationalized their behavior and then minimized it uh, both at the same time by mischaracterizing uh, what is a violation of law as a technical problem. Um, secondly, and, and the other, or the second thing I think we need to recognize that, that David also alluded to is that um, culture to me does not have a finish line. Um, David said that you know it's it's the leader of the organization uh, that sets the tone and culture, and I, I believe that to be the case. But culture also happens in every meeting you have, uh, in every communication you have, in every promotion, um, every compensation discussion, uh, every goal setting meeting. It happens on a daily basis, and it's reinforced uh, daily. And because I believe that compliance and culture are so tightly knit. If culture doesn't have a finish line, then compliance doesn't have a finish line either. And so I don't think um, I don't think it's safe for an organization to say, "Hey, we've implemented these program elements for a compliance program. We're done." Right? I think just like any other risk in the organization, periodically you have to go back and assess, "Hey, what's changed in the organization? How how have our risks changed? How has our culture changed? Who's in charge?" Um, and, and I think all all of that ties together. Um, and, and finally, it, I think the, the, the last thing I, I would point out about Volkswagen is just let it be a cautionary tale. You've got to understand, uh, as, as David rightly pointed out, that there was actually nothing remarkable about how this happened. Um, dominant personalities are inside every organization. Um, aggressive goal setting is at every organization. Those things aren't inherently bad. But you need to understand that if you don't have the checks and balances in place to keep them reined in, then very bad things can happen. And uh, I want to make this one announcement. We will be concluding at 1, 1 p.m., so please stay with us. Uh, this is a great panel. One of the is issues I thought about, David, is is I, I always wanted to be a general counsel at a major corporation. It's never going to happen. I prayed to be general counsel to God, and God said, okay, you can be a general counsel, but the Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> and I said, well, what about a Fortune 500 company, God? And uh, anyway, so you get that one prayer answered. But uh, you've been a general counsel at a private sector organization, and, and you are now. And then before that, you were a general counsel at a major uh, cabinet agency. Um, the role of the general counsel is critically important in both places, but could you ask some observations about what you think the GC should be doing in these situations? A couple of thoughts about that. I, uh, I think the, the general counsel and, uh, and the legal department in general, uh, different companies have, have different, different cultures and, and the legal department plays a different role, I think. Um, I think both at, uh, at DOE when I was there, but, uh, but especially at NRG, um, it, it, I don't want to, um, I want the lawyers to be sewn into what the business is doing. I think the, uh, you know, I think there are, there are companies out there where the legal department is viewed as either the department of no, that's where you go to get ideas rejected, um, or they view themselves as solely focused on risk mitigation. You know, if there's a company out there who's uh, with, with public shareholders who says that their, their, you know, risk mitigation is what they're, they're in the business of, then, I mean, you know, they're not going to stay in business very long. Um, you know, companies have different objectives and they, of course, have shareholders that are, are absolutely brutal in terms of demanding results. Justin was talking about the, um, uh, you know, the the, uh, the financial or the, the competing um, uh, objectives, and of course the need to meet uh, meet corporate objectives. I will tell you, you know, the the, the real world out there, and you all know it, um, whether it's at the law firm or at a company. I mean, it is brutally competitive, absolutely brutally competitive, and the need to make your numbers. Um, it, it, shareholders are absol absolutely unmerciful in terms of, uh, of companies needing to make their numbers. And not just shareholders, but the funds and the analysts and all of that. I think in terms of the law, and, and I think that as lawyers and within a company, 
you can't view yourselves as being divorced from that. You'll, you, you will quick, you quickly make yourself either irrelevant or ensure that you only are spoken to when, uh, when no one else actually really cares what the answer is, or actually when they're looking for a reason so they can blame you for saying no. Um, if, you're, uh, if, if you don't recognize the objectives of your business colleagues. I actually never refer to the, uh, to the businesses or the business leaders at NRG as my clients. That I am, um, they're my colleagues, um, I work with them, I, uh, I, I, but I don't take orders from them. And I don't think there, and I think there, uh, I think there is, for the lawyer, I want the lawyers at the company to both think of themselves as colleagues with the business folks, both in terms of not viewing the business objective as superior to compliance or as to legal, legal compliance or, or to anything that the lawyers want. But at the same time, I want the lawyers to own the result too. I don't ever want to be in a situation where the lawyers give it legal advice and then just figure the consequences of it are the business people's problem, either from a financial or a business perspective. And I think the, uh, I, I think that that it both ensure, and, and again, you have to have the, I think you have to have the right culture within your own legal organization and within your company to make that work. But to me, it, it is, uh, it's focused on ensuring that the lawyers both um, know that, uh, that they are, are th that they are sewn in with the business. The other thing is too, um, and, and that their views will, will actually um, uh, hold sway in those business meetings. The other thing too that I, I, the lawyers at the company, they know that I will back them up. There's no way that, uh, that a large organization can work if, the, uh, if, if it's sort of, well, you know, we got to take this to the general counsel. General counsel has to actually approve. You know, why am I here even though what, today, even though we've got what's going on in Texas? Here's the answer, because there are people in charge of that who know exactly what it is that they are responsible for and who are empowered to make decisions, and they know what they are empowered to do, and they don't need my permission to do it. And I think that there is a, that, that in order for folks to, to really be able to make hard decisions, make them stick, and to be able to be viewed that way within the company, they have to know that they have that backing from the leaders of their organization. Uh, thank you, David. And, and and uh, as how these things are configured inside of corporations, Mitchell is interesting. Um, there's some, and I'll come back to the whole panel about this, but um, the, the situation that I see more commonly now is there's a separate compliance officer, somebody, somebody whose day-to-day -day responsibilities are dealing with compliance. So that person, I think we talked about this earlier, that person wakes up in the morning thinking about compliance. So can you touch on that some? And yeah, no. Thanks, Joe. And that's something I have very definite feelings about. And I will say that there's not unanimity among the general counsel population in the country. I've had some uh, animated discussions with some of my counterparts at other companies where the GC office and the office of compliance is reporting to one individual. I feel very strongly that that is certainly not the way I want to go and certainly not the way our company goes. A, to Joe's first point, I want somebody in compliance waking up every morning thinking about how the compliance processes, systems, all that stuff of our organization can be improved and implemented. And I think if somebody is uh, 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 undertaking multiple functions, that kind of undivided interest necessarily gets diluted, and I think that can be harmful to the organization. A related pure legal point as to the uh, need, in my opinion, for a division between the two functions is uh, legal privilege. And I think uh, it's very important that in all cases when the legal department is providing advice, is acting on behalf of the company, it's, ne it's necessary to be able to assert privilege. That can often be called into question if the legal department is simultaneously engaged in compliance functions. So for those two reasons alone, I think it's essential. And I think uh, another reason as well 
uh, to separate the two functions is I think the legal department, even though in, in, in our company we, uh, we try to be uh, a problem solution department as opposed to uh, a department of no, but I would say compliance is often perceived as kind of more supportive, more helpful, or it can be in a way that can encourage people to come forward. Uh, with far less concern they might otherwise have if they were to approach the legal department. Again, I think culturally our department does a good job of not being, you know, hard or intimidating, but nevertheless on a general basis I think uh, employees, particularly when you have thousands of employees around the country in, in retail environments, will perhaps be more likely to come forward uh, in a compliance context as opposed to a legal one. Thank you. Uh, Justin? Yeah. I would just say, you know, regardless of what the org chart says, um, it, just to reiterate this point, is that people throughout the organization need to understand they have a hand in compliance. And, and it can't be outsourced to the compliance department because um, that's where the breakdown starts to happen uh, and, and how uh, things like Volkswagen uh, begin to happen. You know, put yourself inside Volkswagen. At some point, there was a meeting. Right, where this software was being discussed in detail, and yet nobody stood up and said, wait a minute, <laughs> this is breaking the law, we can't do that, right? Maybe someone in there thought, you know what, that's compliance, you know, once this gets to their desk, they'll address it, that's not my responsibility. That's, that's the organizational structure that you have to fight against and get compliance into the culture of the organization. Yeah. And I I, I, I'm sorry, Joe, I was just going to say, I mean, I, as a structural matter, I, I completely agree with Mitchell about the, the, the separation between chief compliance officer and, uh, and general counsel. I mean, our, our company, the chief compliance officer um, is, uh, is separate from the office of the general counsel. Our chief compliance officer reports directly to the CEO. Um, he has, uh, has uh, people in his organization that, uh, and again, it's completely off, separate from the office of the general counsel. Um, and I, I think that is by far the superior structure, in my own view. I mean, one of the things we were discussing a little bit earlier, I and mean, you see this, this uh, discussion going on in another part of corporate America right now, whether or not to separate the function of chairman of the board and president and CEO. I will say at NRG, we have a separate chairman. Um, uh, the chairman of our board is not the president and CEO of the company. And, uh, and I, I know different companies have different views about that, um, certainly, and, and different investors do, but, uh, but in my, my view, that is, uh, that is a superior form. And why do you think that? Well, because I think the, 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 um, it, it actually creates, in some way, it certainly doesn't make it easier. Um, to, for the company to run, but it creates a constructive tension with, uh, with both the, uh, the, the chairman of the board and who, is, uh, who works with the board and who, of course, is responsible very directly to the shareholders and who is elected by the shareholders, um, and with the ability to establish policy and overall governance decisions by the board being separate from the president and CEO who really is implementing, you know, you think about what the President of the United States is in terms of the head of the executive branch, who's execute, who's establishing the, the, uh, a lot of the, the policies and, and, uh, and missions of the company and executing on them. But it, it creates, and I, I, I've got lots of examples where there has been sometimes difficult, but o an overall constructive tension between the, the chairman of the board and the, uh, the president and the CEO, just in terms of how the company is run. Um, I, I would echo that point. I think structurally, whenever within any group there is somebody designated as the leader, as the point person, that person will automatically get a certain degree of deference on the other members of the group. And when the CEO is not the chairman, then at the board level, you have that greater opportunity for sort of more constructive uh, uh, discussion of key issues. We were talking about before um, bringing up the idea of for example, in GM, where the general counsel knew what was going on, did nothing about it. Let it keep going, went with the company drift of, we're just going to wait and, and see. We're going to figure out first what the problem, how the problem's being caused. Once we figure that out, we'll maybe do a recall or something. We're just going to let it go. What do you think is the responsibility of the general counsel? What should they have done? Yeah, you know, the, I mean, it's a great question, Amy. I mean, we were talking about a little bit internally, and again, if you take a look at the, any of you take a look at this report, you will see that even after the, uh, 
the lawyers, uh, it was it, where it was in this deposition, where all the different facts were linked up. It, it took nine months to make the recall. Well, the the big part of the reason was there was this search for the root cause. Well, again, and you think, well, okay, well, who can be faulted for searching for a root cause? And that there's nothing wrong with searching for a root cause. I mean, that's actually a good thing to do. Um, and yet, some of the time that can actually be viewed as, uh, and, and so. I, I, I'm sure that in, the, in that particular circumstance, folks thought, I'm doing exactly what I ought to be doing. Um, I don't know in the particular, I don't actually remember the, the facts about some of it, about what was actually percolated up to the general counsel himself at, at a couple of different points. So I, I, I don't remember that for sure. But there were certain people, there were certainly lawyers who, uh, who had the facts in front of them. Um, and I think the, it is, um, it is something where I think the, some of the time uh, the general counsel, the general counsel himself or herself or the lawyers have to actually take, have to, have to take a hard stand in terms of saying that, um, that they're going to do something that is not necessarily in the immediate economic best interest of the company. I was saying earlier about how, you know, I like having the uh, legal department sewn in with the, 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 uh, the businesses at NRG. I forgot to add one important corollary to that, which is the compensation of every single lawyer in the company is established by me. They all, they all report up to the general counsel. They do not report up directly to a, to a business leader or um, to the head, the, the owner of a P&L. And every single lawyer, every single member of the legal department, their compensation in the end is established by me. So I think that is a uh, um, it, it just a, a check in the bet. You want you want the lawyers to actually be sewn in and, and be able to help advance the interests of the company, but in the end, you want to have have some separation as to the establishment of that those duty, uh, the performance of those duties as well. In terms of. Uh GM, my, my understanding, and I haven't read the report from Tony Volucas, but my understanding is there was a reporting uh, ceiling. So if the dollar value of the matters in question didn't exceed a certain dollar value, there wasn't reporting up to the actual general counsel of General Motors. It's kind of bizarre that that would be happening. So that insulated uh, him or her from knowledge. So they, that person never had knowledge, but it just seems, it's just remarkable. And so, you know the target of these investigations uh, could it could drift into the general counsel's office at some point. Obviously, if there had been knowledge and that no action was taken, or there was some sort of effort to cover that information up, but there wasn't anything to that effect in, in the GM case, and nothing was ever pursued. But uh, what, when we're talking about corporations, we're talking about more than the general counsel's office. And I think, uh, I think I wanted to ask about human resources and corporations and how, how they play a role and how you, you deal with a, the VP of HR, Vice President of Operations. There are a lot of different, and even in Mitchell, your smaller corporation, there are different leaders that you're talking with on a regular basis, and Justin, to a certain extent, you. It seems to me if you have, um, uh, I guess there's disgruntled, which means unhappy employees, and then there's gruntled, I've always wondered what a gruntled employee is, but anyway, so you have disgruntled employees, which is an unhappy workplace. People are going to be trying to sabotage things. So, is this something that somehow within the purview of compliance that you, your employees are feel good about being at National Vision? Um, well, I think Joe, with respect to our working relationship with any department, and obviously when. Uh, you're in the legal team. You have to interact with every single department in the organization. We have a number of them. We have finance, marketing, a number of other departments. And in each case, um, there's an accommodation. It's almost like there's a negotiation that kind of works itself out in practice over time as to the degree of confidence, the degree of trust, the degree of running room we would give to another department to do, engage in certain things. So for example, with human resources, we've got the, you know, almost 11,000 employees around the country now. They're going to be, obviously, HR matters coming up on a regular basis. And we have policies in place where we give HR the ability to handle them, to investigate them up to a certain point, and, which is defined, and then at that point we have to get involved. And so I think, Joe, on a, on a general basis, it is something that gets worked out in practice organizationally, uh, driven by the, you know, the needs of the organization. Yeah. Uh, Justin, any comments or thoughts? Well, in thinking about HR, I probably, I probably think about it a little bit differently. Um, 
in, in, in thinking through the evolution of compliance and, and measuring effectiveness, you know, several years ago there was a big focus on reporting mechanisms. You know, how do we get hotlines in place when, when people have a problem, we need to have an open door policy, we need to hear from our people that we have an issue. And then, then big data came, right? And we had a big push around data analytics and um, what can we use in data to identify uh, potential problem areas. Um, but now I think what we're moving towards is um, culture audits, and I think this is where HR kind of comes into play. So if, if it was, in the beginning it was listening, and then it was watching, I think now it's asking uh, proactively. I think we need to get HR out in different areas of the business, maybe alongside of internal audit or alongside of compliance, and sit down and ask our people about the core values and, and are they, do they understand the core values of the organization in conjunction with um, the mission and objectives of the business um, and make sure that there's not a disconnect so that when you have that moment, um, people know to stand up and, 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 and speak. Um, uh, but you know, it, it's, it's HR going out and asking employees about trust. You know, do you trust who you report to? Do you trust who reports to you? Do you respect them? Do they respect you? Um, ask the same questions about management, and leadership, and, and different departments, um, and, and you know, talk about the compensation process. Engage your your organization and, and and try to get a sense for where could the vulnerabilities be, where could the ethical vulnerabilities be. So, and uh, and we're in this world market um, that we're competing with the Chinese every day in the world market for for share of business, and I, I realize this may not touch NRG, and it may touch National Vision, but you may have some perspectives on this. We, the, 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 the notion of uh, companies coming to America, for example, uh, Geely owns, Volks, owns Volvo, they are uh, a, Ch a Chinese corporation. So in terms of uh, other companies, uh, in fact, uh, Chrysler, uh, Fiat is being looked at by a Chinese corporation. So there's a lot of foreign ownership in the United States. Volkswagen sold its products in the United States. These, their culture is coming here. They're looking at our culture, trying to adapt to it. One of the things I think maybe in, in, the, in the case of Volkswagen is it might have been a cultural lapse in terms of how, how things were done here, perhaps. And I know I'm, don't, I'm not seeking an answer immediately from you, Amy, on that one. But in terms of in terms of our business around the world, we're competing on an uneven playing field we, because we're, so, we, although we may think we're not always ethical in the United States, comparatively, we have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which creates significant standards of conduct and compliance that we need to engage with. And I just wanted to, to ask, you know, because is there, is there a way for us to, certainly our employees, uh, corporate executives need to understand that we are held to a higher standard in America about how we conduct ourselves, but uh, is that an issue sometimes when you're talking to executives when they say, look, we, how can we compete? The Chinese are eating our lunch around the world they're, because they're able to bribe uh, people we can't. So anyway, to put it, put it bluntly. So thoughts on that? Well, in our case, uh, we're a retail company and uh, we're owned by a private equity firm. And to some extent, I'm sure there's a lot of foreign investment in the portfolio funds of the private equity firm. So it's kind of a, a hybrid to that extent. But uh, as to direct competitors of us that are uh, from abroad, there really aren't any at this point in this country. There's always a possibility that could happen. I would say, Joe, to this general concept, we have uh, a couple of outsourced labs outside of the United States. We have no ownership interest. We've done that very carefully to kind of minimize uh, liability. Nevertheless, we engage on a routine basis, audits, kind of corporate social responsibility stuff, inspect the factories, make sure they're complying with environmental employment and related laws. So to that extent, clearly what happens abroad does affect us. Justin, any comments? And, and then David. And then no, I, you know, I don't think I've seen or had visibility into um, other than the FCPA uh, aspects of it, um, the you know the thing that comes to mind is are the are the business goals properly aligned with um, with the values of the organization? Do do the business goals outweigh? You know, are, are your people more incentivized to um, to break the rules than they are to follow the rules? Um, yeah. And and I think that's that's something you have to measure 
on a constant basis. Um, again, you know, with the idea that that uh, compliance doesn't have a finish line. David, I mean, I, you know, your your broader point, Joe, basically, it, it, I mean, is is not just with respect to foreign companies. It's just what is it that we have to do to su successfully compete? I mean, you know, it, it it could be a foreign company, and it could be one that uh, where where is a cultural matter, another country doesn't view any particular problem with uh, with with you know, uh, under the table payments to a government official. Certainly that actually occurs in, in some other uh, com um, countries and, and some other cultures and we have to, uh, companies that have to compete in those areas have to deal with that. But your broader point is just how is it that you actually judge your own conduct in comparison to your competitors? And I think that it's, it's actually, um, you know, you, you uh, you go back to the, and it's something we all face. I mean, it's something you face whether you're at a law firm or at a company or anywhere else where, where I mean, how much, how many of us haven't been in a situation where we would say, well, you know, look at what he or what she is doing and I actually have to compete with that. And think to yourself, okay, well, how am I going to respond to that? I mean, I think that, that happens a lot. And I think the, that, uh, and that if, it, it's an element of the competitive world we live in that we have to actually deal with those challenges. And I will say that too, just as a matter of the brutally competitive world that we live in, I'm certainly in the, in the energy business and I'm sure in a lot of the other, maybe unique, maybe in all of your businesses. I mean, it's, there's nothing unique about the energy business when it comes to that. When times are economically hard, as in when, when prices are down, when uh, commodity markets are tough, as they have been for a number of years in the, the energy industry. And I'll tell you, that, that is something, and I talk to folks internally at the company about that, that is the time to be extra vigilant. Um, it's, the, uh, it's not like the shareholders give you a break by saying, well, you know, yeah, we know the, the commodity, commodity markets are really tough, so, I mean, the fact that you totally missed on your earnings, I mean, we, we, that's okay. No, they, they don't say that. Um, and I think it just leads to a lot of us who, are, who think about these issues to have to be extra vigilant in the most economically tough times. Again, you look at the, I think, you know, and Amy was talking about the Volkswagen situation and, and the whole GM report it's, it is replete with the fact that cost cutting was, a, was of central importance. And think about what was going on at General Motors. Think about when all this was going on. Not only did you have this cost cutting, you had the financial crisis, you had a recession, you, you had, we're talking about people living in Michigan and dealing with, with the impact in the state of Michigan, it's not, um, which was of course uh, brutally affected by the recession. And so how is it that you actually deal with that and do, you have to be aware of the situation you find yourself in as a matter of both your community and your larger, uh, the larger economic circumstances and approach these issues in that context.